We'd like to welcome in a very special guest, Mr. Jack O'Halloran, a boxing Hall of Famer out in California, uh, accomplished actor, author, producer, and of course, a hometown guy for our Philly audience from the Delaware Valley. He was born and uh, grew up in the Philadelphia region. Mr. O'Halloran, thanks so much for your time and welcome to Sports Talk. <clears throat> Jack, please. And, uh, <laughs> nice to talk to you guys. Oh, it's our pleasure to have you on. And, you know, first of all, I, I know you're a hometown Philly guy. Uh, you're a diehard sports fan. We'll talk about your career in a moment. But what was it like uh, following the Eagles this year? And uh, how proud uh, are you that they're was, Super Bowl champs? I thought it was great. You know, I, uh, uh, they have a great team. They've put together, I've been waiting for them to put their program back together for a few years. Mm -hmm. um, and I, uh, it's amazing that they wind up in the Super Bowl. I, I, back, I also like the Patriots because I spent a lot of time in Boston. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, uh, it was a great game. It was a terrific, terrific game, you know. It's, uh, and I, I think they'll be around for a while now. You know, they've put together their program really well again, which has been a lot of years for a lot of people anticipating it. Uh, the Eagles fans are probably one of the greatest sets of fans in the NFL. And... Uh, <laughs> they were they were due a team. Thank heavens. Yeah. Could you talk about uh, your experience with the Eagles? Because uh, you almost played for the Eagles back in the day uh, before you became uh, an actor, obviously. But uh, could you talk about that experience of how you almost played NFL football with the Eagles? Yeah, we you know, I was when I was uh, when I was a young man, you know, you had to graduate from school before mm -hmm. you could play. You know, they, they didn't have hardship cases then. So when I came out of school in my sophomore year, I was grabbed by the Jets, <clears throat> Eubank, um, and um, they put me on like uh, they had. Uh, it's almost like when you play baseball and you're and you're playing in a, in a farm team. You know, they had it. We had a, a Eastern Coast uh, semi-professional uh, football league that uh, a lot of us played out of. It. There was a team called. You know, it's in Philly. They had a team down there, and the Christie brothers played, and uh, uh, several very good ball players that were going up into the NFL uh, played there. And it was a it was a crazy league. Like we we would play uh, three or four games a week sometimes, just uh, to keep your levels up, you know, uh, and play in both ways. It was yeah. uh, it was kind of a kind of a crazy crazy deal, but. Uh, when it came time for me to be able to play, I, I had talked to Eubank Levin. I, I said I want to go down and uh, take a shot with the Eagles because uh, I was from Philly and they had a great team at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jerry Wallman had just bought the club. And uh, and I thought he was going to do some great changes, but uh, he got stuck with a coach called Joe Q. Harry yep. <laughs> because of Pete Rozelle. You know, and, and people never really divulge the whole story about that. Is that uh, when Joe Q. Harrick was, uh, he got a full time scholarship at the University of San Francisco when Roselle was coaching there. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the favors were turned back and forth. And he was, when Jerry Warman bought the team, Roselle put a condition in there that Q. Harrick had to go as the coach. And uh, and I watched this guy trade a championship football team away. Yeah. I mean, he he came in and he traded and he traded Sonny Jurgensen because Jurgensen was doing commercials, <laughs> and he thought that was obscene, really. Wow. And 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 since Sonny also owned the motel outside of Philly, and he thought that they were doing. Uh, pandering and stuff out of it, which is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And they had. Um, so he traded Jurgensen and McDonald, and then he traded uh, Maxi Bond, and he traded uh, Irv Cross uh, to uh, uh, the L.A. Rams for a kickoff return. God, it never played. Yeah. And he traded five of uh, five of the best young linemen uh, to Green Bay for Jim uh, Ringo, who was who was finished. His career was finished. And then he traded Randy Beisler, who was an All-American number one draft pick to San Francisco. Bruce Van Dyke, he traded four or five guys over to Pittsburgh uh, who became all pro ball players. Bruce Van Dyke was a tremendous guard from Missouri. Uh, he and, and just kept trading people away. And 
it was kind of ridiculous, you know. And it's, so I, I was in a meeting. We were in a meeting one day with Tim Brown and I came out of the, out of the meeting. We were walking down the hall, and he walked right by us. And I turned around. And I said, "Geez, you not say hello to people?" And and he come up with some gruffy deal. And I said, "You know what? Why you're out of trade me? I'm <laughs> leaving. I'm, I'm I'm not playing." And Timmy Brown turned around and said, "And why you're out of trade me?" And he got <laughs> traded to Baltimore. Yeah. Uh, and it was. Uh, and Muhammad Ali had just won the title. So I said to a few friends of mine in Philly, uh, Sam Margolis was a, was a big boxing guy. Um, I said, yeah, I can beat that kid. And they said, wow, that's a great idea. And they put me in the gym. And uh, six months later, I was boxing professionally. And I couldn't box amateur because if you were involved in a professional sport, in those days, you couldn't do two things. You couldn't box amateur, you know, if you were playing a professional sport. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just went right into boxing professional. Yeah, and you and fought. I was in, oh, go ahead. I was just going to ask you about some of the I had my first few fights down in Philly, and, the, and then I was, something happened down there, and we had a bit of a rhubarb, and they sent me to Boston. And um, mm -hmm. I was a, a bit of a, a hooligan in the streets, you know. So <laughs> they sent me up to Boston, uh, and I resumed my career up there. And uh, you know, I, I, don't, I never lost a fight in Boston either. Yeah. And, um, it was uh, the the game began, you know. Yeah. Could you talk about some of the boxers that uh, you you uh, went up against? Uh, Ken Norton, I know. Larry Middleton, George Foreman, uh, Muhammad Ali's brother. You you knocked him out, and then you almost uh, boxed with Muhammad Ali himself. Well, we we were I, I was signed with Ali mm -hmm. to, when when I fought Norton in San Diego. Um, it was at the back end of I was 1972 when I fought Norton. Uh, I actually beat Norton pretty good, and they they gave him a there was a split decision. And actually, I, in the ninth round, the the it was probably one of the best heavyweight fights I had in California in a long time. And in the ninth round, the uh, referee rang the bell three times before anybody heard it. And then when he separated us and I was going back to my corner, he ran across the ring and hit me behind the head. Mm. And the commissioner jumped up and then he said, you know, if you can't continue the fight's over, you just won. Uh, you won on a foul. And I, I was so furious. I said, <laughs> I was so stupid because I'm fighting in his hometown. And uh, so I, you know, he won a split decision, but I won the city, so I stayed there. And I had some problems on the East Coast with union deals and stuff like that. So I, I decided that California would be a better place to stay for a while. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I ripped off about seven or eight wins, and uh, and I fought a kid, uh, Henry Clark, for the for the California heavyweight title, and I beat him. And uh, and I fought. I get a phone call from Ali, and he said, uh, you're fighting my brother this week. you got to do me a favor. And I said, I'll do you a favor, sign a contract. <laughs> and he said, no, I, I, we'll work a deal out, but you got to do me this favor. you got to get my brother out of box. And I said, uh, okay. Well, I looked around. I, I said, I better get in the gym and start training a little bit. <laughs> And and uh, and I fought Rockman, a nice kid, and I knocked him out in the ninth round. And uh, he never fought again. He was uh, so uh, we had made an agreement to fight in the arena in San Diego, and we we uh, sent telegrams back and forth to each other. Uh, and Norton was owned by two of the wealthiest guys in San Diego, Bob Byron and, and a guy named Mark Rifkin. Art Rifkin owned Coca-Cola, and Bob Byron owned La Jolla. Uh, nice men, too, actually. And they um, they went to Chicago with a suitcase full of money and gave it to Herbert Muhammad. And Muhammad Ali called me on the phone. He said, I, I, I don't know how to apologize enough to you. He said, but it's out of my control. He said, I, I you know, I, uh, I have to take this fight with Norton. And I said, okay, well, we'll find a date and do it another day. And uh, he came down to uh, <clears throat> to fight Norton. And Muhammad and I were very good friends. Mm -hmm. he, had, he had a guy with him by the name of Gene Kilroy, who was uh, uh, I'd known since the Eagles. He was a, a publicist on the Eagles. 
uh, and he was with Ali his, his whole career. Um, and he, uh, you know, they, um, we worked out a deal where we were going to fight in Australia when he fought, uh, he fought Bugner instead. And they it was th three or four times we were supposed to fight. And, mm -hmm. and in my career, I was gone in and out the window because I, you know, in, in those days, you know, boxing was a whole different sport. Sure. Uh, and, you know, I, when I first started fighting, you got $10 a round, <laughs> you know. Uh, nobody you, was making big money until Ali came in the game. And you and, fought like nine or ten times a year, not like, you, you know, nowadays you have months between fights. Well, I, I, you know, like in my real career, you know, I, I had 25 fights that were never recorded in, in New England. There was a guy named Sam Silverman who uh, ran shows up in Maine, Portland, Maine, and all different places. And uh, and we all and it was a crew of people up there. We'd go to all the boxing matches. It was just a you know sport thing, you know. And I would go up and he'd say, I'd take him out and say, Listen, uh, we're short about. Will you fight tonight? And I and I'd say, Well, you can't tell my management about this. He said, well, No, 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 because I was owned by uh, some pretty serious uh, uh, gangsters from Philly. And uh, Sam Margolis was a uh, he owned Liston, and he was very much involved. He was in, in the Jewish mob in Philadelphia. Uh, Sam was a, Sam was a serious player, and a seriously nice guy. I liked him a lot. Blakey Plarmo uh, from South Philadelphia, and um, so I would fight under under a name. I would just go in and knock a guy. I had 25 knockouts that never were recorded on my record, you know, and it was just like a gym workout. You yeah. know what I mean? You know, it wasn't for the money. It was just for I, I just love the sport. But, you know, when you, you know, I, I had a, a very infamous father and um, I uh, was involved in his world a lot in those days. And so boxing was like a day job. You know, I, uh, if I, if I had ever, <laughs> a funny story, I'd tell you, I, I, I beat a guy in Detroit named Alvin Blue Lewis, who was, uh, ranked number two or one and two in the world. And uh, he had fought Ali in, uh, in in Ireland and went 13 rounds with him. And they were getting ready to make another Lewis fight. He came back and he beat Ernie Terrell and he beat another guy. And they were, he was supposed to fight Buster Mathis. And Mathis couldn't get a license in Michigan. So they called me on the phone and they said, uh, in California, and they said, would you like to fight uh, Alvin Blue Lewis in Detroit? And, and I said, uh, can I get a license there? Because at the time, I was they took my license in California for several months because of supposed organized crime thing, which all turned out to be bull. Uh, but they, uh, so the guy said, yeah, I positively get a license. So I took the fight on like uh, a week and a half notice. And... Uh, and I went up to Detroit, and I beat this guy terrible. Oh, I really beat him bad. And uh, I went us up in Ali's camp afterwards, about two weeks later. And he and I put on a, a show. He was he was great. We we went in the dress room, and he was kicking the door and punching it like we were fighting back there, you know. <laughs> and, and the press ate it up. They were out there, you know, waiting for who was going to be the survivor to come out the door and stuff. And we're sitting down eating dinner, and he, and he, he said to if I give you a fight, will you really try and beat me? I said, son, let me tell you something. For the first time in my career, I will go away to camp and uh, and do the six to eight weeks preparation that's supposed to be, and you better bring a gun in the ring because we will have a war. <laughs> he, he said, two stakes, please. <laughs> and he, was, uh, he had a great sense of humor. Muhammad was... Uh, I really liked him a lot. We, we we had a lot of good times together. And he was, uh, when you got one on one with him, he was uh, a very bright, very articulate individual. He uh, he uh, was probably one of the greatest fighters of our era. And mm -hmm. he, it's very sad that he lost years in his youth over that draft business, you know. And uh, and and the truth of that story probably I don't know if we'll ever really surface as to how that whole problem happened with him. Mm -hmm. uh, his brother Rockman was, 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 uh, was the Muslim before he was. 
And, uh, and Muhammad came from uh, Kentucky, and there was a very wealthy group down there when he first started boxing that, that owned his contract. And they had a, there was a clause in there that uh, had to be renewed. His contract was up for renewal. And uh, the Muslim people from, uh, I mean, Herbert Muhammad, stepped in and scooped them up before these guys re-signed them. And uh, and they so they were because when he was boxing for that group down there, he was what with classification draft was one Y, you know, mm-hmm. which you were exempt. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they went in and changed it to one A, and that's how he got into that into the problem. Then he turned around and said, you know, I will go. I'll go in the army. He said, you know, I'll do a Joe Lewis. You know, I'll just go in the service and whatever. And and they said, uh, uh-uh, uh, nope. You go in there, we're going to make an example of it. We'll shoot your ass from behind. <laughs> and, you know, it was just uh, – so it was more of – is there was a lot more involved in the thing than what anybody really knew. And and for the couple of years, you know, he they, what they used to do is bring guys in and, and he would box eight to ten rounds in the gym to try to keep his his hey, his, his tools. Yeah. And uh, when he fought Frazier uh, in New York – I mean, he gave Frazier a beating in New York that he, Frazier was never the same afterwards. Mm-hmm. He was in a hospital for three days afterwards. And they, uh, they made a deal with him that if he lost the Frazier fight, he would, uh, his draft problems would go away. And they did. Mm-hmm. And he came back boxing. And, you know, and he, uh, when he fought Frazier, came back and fought Frazier again, they, you know, they were, he just, he, it was a toy game. He, you know, he, uh, he was that good, you know. He he could do whatever he wanted in the, in the ring, and you know. And he they had the whole myth about him and Liston, mm-hmm. uh, and the and the main fight, and the saying that it was fixed. That wasn't fixed. The, the the deal with that was that you know they were they were scheduled to fight, and uh, and Ali contracted a hernia, mm. and they had to postpone the fight, and Charlie. Was another bit of a hooligan, and he uh, he never trained. He didn't train from when they stopped the fight the, the first time. He stopped training, and Sam Margolis, who was his manager, who had really control of him, uh, his wife went through a, a brain tumor operation. So Sam was focused on his wife and wasn't paying attention to Liston, mm-hmm. and Liston didn't go to camp. Took his wife to camp when he did go, and he. Um, I don't know whether he was in the greatest of shape when he fought Ali, but you have to understand something. You know, you, they they thought it was a mythical punch, but uh, when you have a guy that's 220 pounds, and that's what a Muhammad was, and he's coming down on you, and you're coming up, and he's coming down with a right hand, and he had speed and power, and that was no fluky punch he hit him with. Mm-hmm. He hit him with a good punch, and he, and he knocked him out. And Charlie... Charlie was a funny guy. If you followed his career, he hated to see his own blood. Hmm. And when he fought Muhammad Ali the first time and he quit in the ring, it's because Ahmed cut him in the second round. And his eye was bleeding down hmm. on him, and he uh, he said that he hurt his shoulder. That was a bunch of rhubarb. He just quit. He quit on the stool. Wow. And, uh, and when they come back to fight the second time, you know— uh, Muhammad was Muhammad was Muhammad was a he was just a when you look at some of the fights he had when he was in his prime and when he um, he was so fast and when he fought when he fought Foreman he asked me about Foreman he said what do you think about George Foreman well I had fought Foreman in the in the garden and uh, and I got caught a shot it was again my own fault I, I trained like a week and a half for the fight. Hmm. And, and I don't make excuses for stuff. You know, it's, it's uh, I had um, in 1968, <clears throat> I fought a kid in uh, in, in uh, California by the name of Manuel Ramos, who was ranked number two in the world. They were looking to make him a title fight. But I had fought 11 days before that fight in Africa, South wow. Africa, Johannesburg. And four ten rounds, and I was down in Johannesburg, and I got in great shape. I was down there for like a month, and I was off the streets, you know, Philly, and and I uh, in Boston, and and uh, 
and I got in very good shape. And I came back, and, uh, and 11 days later, I fought Manuel Ramos in L.A. And uh, <laughs> I remember when I got off the plane and I went down to the forum to meet uh, George Parnassus, who was, the, who was a huge promoter in that time in California. And uh, he looked at me, and he said, uh, my God, you're in very good shape. I said, not only that, but I'm going to knock this bum out tonight. He <laughs> said, you can't do that. You can't do that. He said, we're getting ready for a time. You can't do that. And I said, well, guess what? And I knocked him out in the seventh round, and they uh, and upset a lot of apple carts. Yeah. And they, they uh, so then I couldn't get a fight for uh, a few months. And, you know, they, um, and they come up with the foreman fight. So I was busy doing some street stuff, union business, uh, and uh, doing things I shouldn't have been doing. And, you know, so I, they, when they gave me the foreman fight, I said, "Yeah, but I no problem." And I almost knocked foreman out in the second round, actually. And he always <laughs> he said one of the top four or five guys that could hit and I, when I hit him, and, he, and I didn't follow it up again, my own mistake. And he caught me a he caught me a, a pretty good shot. End of the fourth round and the fifth round, he caught me again, and, and they stopped the fight right away, which kind of irked me a little bit. But um, it was uh, it, it turned a lot of things around. And you know, after the Ramos fight, when I when I knocked out Manuel Ramos, they wanted me to um, do a picture of the Great White Hope, yeah, with James Earl Jones and. Uh, and, uh, and, I, and it was the deal was all set. A man called Raymond Patriarca from New England. Uh, they were trying to get me off the streets. So they, they put me in the movie business. You know, uh, <laughs> that was in Spain, so, right? That was overseas. Yeah, they did it in Spain. So yeah. they, when I went out, to, I, they flew me out from New Jersey and uh, to see the producer. And, uh, and it was all the deal was all set up. Eddie Foy the third. Yeah. Uh, was the was was at Fox, you know, at, at Fox at the time, and he put the deal together, and all I had to do was go in and sign the papers, you know, and the and the uh, the, the, the they had a technician for boxing there, Mushy Callahan, who was a, a known guy by the by the mob down in the back east when he fought as a lightweight, and he was doing all the boxing technical advisors and stuff, so. And he was, oh man, this is great. We'll have a good time and all that stuff. And and I had a conversation with the producer, and the guy said to me, "Wow, he said this is great. Well, you're going to go to Spain for six months, and uh, and we're going to pay you, I think, fifteen hundred dollars a week or something, which was a lot of money in those days for for a guy doing first doing a picture." And I said, "You're going to pay me what?" He said, "We're going to pay you fifteen hundred dollars a week." I said. Uh, you're not paying me anything. I said, I give that away in tips every week. What are you talking about? <laughs> he said, so I said, you know, I don't think this is for me. And I, I, I said, there, there's a guy up in Minneapolis. His name is Jim Beatty. He just retired from boxing. And he's a big, tall, white kid. And he's got six mouths to feed. Uh, here's his phone number. Give him a call. Mm -hmm. He said, you're, you're telling me no? This deal was supposed to be already done and all this other jazz. And I said, eh, I said, I don't think I'm ready for this business yet. Yeah. And I got up and walked out of the room and Eddie Foy was beside himself. You're going to get us killed. He said, what are you, you were supposed to do this picture. Da, 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 da. Went back and forth, back and forth. <laughs> so I just, I, I said, I'll take care of it back home. And I went up and saw Raymond and, and I said, you know, I don't, I don't think I'm ready for this stuff. So we, uh, we went down the street and, you know, so, and then he, and it, it, Steve McQueen did the great, did the Thomas Crown Affair in Boston mm -hmm. in 66 when I first started my career in Boston and I was undefeated and stuff. And, uh, and he and I became very good friends because we looked after him when he was in Boston, made sure he, was, he didn't get in any trouble. And, and I like Steve a lot. And he, and he said, you know, come down on the set. I want to get you your card. We want you in the movie business. You've got to come out to Hollywood. We'll have a great time. Blah, 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 blah. And I said, oh, I know this business isn't for me. And then when I turned down the Great White Hope, and I, I was walking out of Fox after I said no to the guy. And to show you how fast stories go around. I, James Earl Jones was coming up the steps, and I was going down. And he stopped me, and he said, you're Jack O'Halloran. And I said, yeah. And I said, you're James Earl Jones. <laughs> he said, "He said, is it true what I just heard about you? And I said, well, it depends on what you heard. He said, 
I heard you just told Hollywood to take the biggest picture in Hollywood and stick it. <laughs> I said, well, I guess if you want to look at it that way, he said, i got to shake your hand. I never met anybody that done that before. <laughs> and we became friends after that, you know. And, uh, and they came to me to do several pictures, and I kept saying no. I kept saying no. And, and then at the end of my career, when, when, when I found out, I boxed the whole, my whole career with a disease called acromeglia. Mm-hmm. And uh, I shouldn't have been boxing at all. I mean, uh, I mean, well, I remember when I uh, when I went to fight Norton. This is a fun story. When I went to fight Norton, the the uh, boxing doctor, Bill Lundeen, was a super guy, guy, and he. Uh, I walked in his office to get a physical. And he looked at me and he saw promotional pictures that were two years old or a year old or something like that, and he said, uh, "You know, kid, you're an acromegalic." And I said, "Really? Can I fight or not?" <laughs> he said, yeah, but it's something you really should look into because it's a killer disease. Mm. A very, very rare disease, and it, you know, it's, but it, it kills people. And I said, yeah, yeah, okay. So when I stayed in San Diego and I, and I beat a lot of people, you know, he said to me one day, he grabbed me when I went in for a physical, and he said, listen, here's the deal. Either you go to Scripps and you get a workup, because we became really good friends, uh, or I'm, I'm going to pull your boxing license. Because this disease will kill you. You got to do something about it. So I went to Scripps and they did a workup on me. And uh, and sure enough, uh, my pituitary was crazy, flowing, throwing. I was pushing out like uh, 180 uh, percent growth hormone when you're only supposed to be putting out 10. And uh, and they they wanted to do an operation where they go up through your and they fix it. And I said uh, I looked it all up and. Uh, 80% of the people lost their gland doing that operation. Then you're on all these hormones for the rest of your life. You got to take a pan full of pills. And I said, I don't think so. I called a friend of mine in New York, and they set up a thing in Boston where they had uh, there was a man called Raymond Shelberg who was a pioneer in the acromegalic deal, and they had a machine up there called a psychotron proton machine. And uh, Harvard, out of Harvard, was the strongest one in, in America. So this guy was doing great things with this machine. So I went up there and uh, and I had uh, and I had this tumor, you know, blown out. I was very lucky. It was one of a, in a thousand that it, it happened the first time that they hit me with this with this beam, you know, uh, and they knocked the tumor out. And uh, and two days after, I was supposed to stay in the hospital for a week to 10 days or something while they recorded everything because this guy was doing all this research and everything. Mm-hmm. And I uh, I had a fight scheduled with Larry Middleton in Baltimore, Maryland. And I was in the hospital, and I was fighting uh, seven days later. <laughs> and wow. So I, I checked myself out of the hospital. I <laughs> just walked out, and I never told him, but I just got up and walked out. And I went down to Baltimore, and I fought Larry Middleton, who was ranked number two in the world. I, I trained three days for the fight. You know? and, but I knew the guy, the promoter in, in Baltimore. He was a bit of a gangster himself, and, and he was a super guy. And he said, you sure you want to do it? And I still had the scabs on my head where they bolted this thing to my head. Wow. And he said, you sure you want to do it? I said, yeah, man, I'll knock this bum out. <laughs> You know, but you, you know, you, the honesty of it is when you're a tough kid and you can fight, you know, uh, I could fight 10 rounds on my head. You know, just uh, it didn't make any, I just, you know, I just uh, had that ability. And mm-hmm. it was very sad that had I put into my career like these guys do, going away to camp and stuff like oh, that. Yeah. Training months uh, for fights. Uh, n- no one would have ever beaten me. I mean, I was a. Uh, you would have had to bring a gun in the ring, and, and that's not being braggadocious. I I just had a natural talent, mm-hmm. and uh, and and so I and I beat a lot of good fighters. Beat Cleveland Williams, um, and, and Terry Daniels, and uh, Carl Gizzy, and uh, you know, and, and Alvin Blue Lewis, and you know, and I would I was my own worst enemy. Mm-hmm. You know, I uh, I just didn't. Uh, had I trained uh, a month for Norton, I'd have knocked Norton out. I had him out a couple times. But, uh, you know, and I, I cut him up pretty bad. And, you know, Norton uh, never, uh, he took a pretty bad beating that night. And his, his management crew came up to me afterwards and said, we didn't know you could fight that well and all this stuff. And I, so I stayed in, in California and I, and I stayed there until I retired. 
and uh, and I know sooner retired, and I get a phone call from uh, a woman I used to do commercials for in, in Atlanta, down in San Diego when I was California heavyweight champion, and uh, she said they want you to do a film called Farewell My Lovely with mm -hmm. Robert Mitchum, and I think you should do it. And I looked around, and I, I owned a couple construction companies, and I was standing in a bar playing pool, and I said, you know, I think it's time. And uh, so I went and I did a screen test, and Robert Mitchum said it's either him or I don't do the movie. So I wound up, and so I blame Robert Mitchum. <laughs> and that got you and into the he film. And I, yeah, and I, got, I did Farewell, My Lovely, and uh, uh, Robert was like a father to me. He was a mentor, and he was a, he was a, a tremendous individual. So Farewell worked out very well. And uh, it, um, in fact, I... <clears throat> When I, after the film was out, um, Johnny Carson wanted me to do his show because he, Mitchum had arranged for me to do the show with him because he said, you'll get nominated for supporting actor if you do his show. And I met him at the Polo Lounge and he's, his show was live at the time. It wasn't taped. And uh, I met him at the Polo Lounge with, when Ed McMahon was with him. And uh, and I knew Ed McMahon from Philadelphia. He was a he was a, a retired. I mean, he was a, a an auxiliary general in, in in the reserves and stuff. So we were doing a deals with buying uh, surplus equipment and selling it to different countries. <laughs> he was he was involved. And when I met him in, at the polo, I said, "Oh, you don't know me. You don't know me." And you know because he he had gotten into this into the the television business and he started out with. Uh, American Bandstand. He was the host for Dick with Dick Clark, American Bandstand, and, and then he got the job to go to New York to do Johnny Carson show. And boom, he became a big celebrity. And we sat down in the polo lounge, and, and John said to me, "You know, uh, the film was really brilliant, and Robert uh, really thinks you're going to be a real up and coming star. And and if you do my show, I think I can get you nominated because and it was a good film. It really was a good film. And it is a good film." And I said, uh, I thought about it. And I said, your show is live, isn't it? He said, yeah. I said, well, I don't think I can do it. He said, what are you talking about? I said, well, I'm going to come on your show, and you're going to ask me about my father, and I'm going to ask you where the men's room's at. <laughs> he said, you would get up and leave? I said, yeah. I said, because I, I don't talk about my father, and I don't let people talk about him. And and uh, I said, I just, uh, he said, well, well, we'll arrange the questions differently and ask you certain questions and stuff. And I said, uh, I said, John, you're the, you're the biggest reporter in the business at this time. And I said, and uh, you have Albert Anastasia's son on your set, and you're not going to ask me about a man that everyone's queried about and asked questions about and no one's ever allowed to talk about. And uh, he said, well, well, I said, you know, and it was foolish because when I turned him down and, and Mitchum called me the next day and he said, what are you doing? I said, well, Robert, you know, you and I have talked about this. I said, and uh, he said, Jack, it's Hollywood. Who cares? It would have been it would have been spectacular for you. I said, what's the matter with you? He said, it's Hollywood. And, uh, and it was foolish. You know, it was one of the key mistakes of my life that I should have done it. And uh, but. You know, I, I went on, did some great films, mm -hmm. and uh, had a lot of fun. And we're still, you know, in the business. And uh, I've written a, a great book called uh, Family Legacy, which uh, we're we're developing right now for a series, and we're going to do uh, films with it because of the density of the material. And uh, we're writing. I have two more books that are going to come out, and we're going to put a lot of truth down and. Uh, and, and what we're doing, what's different about Family Legacy in, in reference to, you know, organized crime and stuff, we're taking the approach of, of the realism of it. You know, and if you go back in the beginning, the government, industry, unions, and organized crime were partners in a lot of ways. And when my father uh, ran the families and, and they was he was head of Murder Incorporated, which was the you know, the, the, which took care of all the business for the families and stuff. And he, the Gambino family was the Anastasia family. 
uh, and it became the Gambino family. Gambino was a lieutenant for my father. And when they assassinated my father, and they assassinated him because he controlled all the docks in, in America. He controlled the, the union for it. And uh, his brother Tony, tough Tony Anastasia. Um, they, um, they assassinated him because he wouldn't go into heroin business. He, they wanted to bring, Genovese wanted to bring it into America, and he said, not on my watch. We didn't sign up for that. You know, and they said, but, you know, Albert, it's only business. And it was the worst mistake that they made because he was the glue for the commission. And when they killed him, things went downhill. And then Genovese did the Appalachian thing and exposed everything to the to the to the world. They got caught running through the woods, all those guys and stuff. It was ridiculous. Um, they, all over nothing. And their stupidity, you know, and the, it changed the whole complexion of um of organized crime. Was it tough? Better. Was it tough deciding to write that down? Because I think you just spent a lot of time before you actually uh, wrote. Well, I, I did. I, I spent a lot of years because I was schooled. And I think I'm one of the few people alive that actually was went across the country and met every one of the Dons, the old timers, uh, Sam Giancana and people in Milwaukee and Detroit and. Uh, and I have an in-depth uh, knowledge of, uh, of organized crime that uh, most people, you know, uh, they write too many comic books about people and they don't tell the truth about things. You know, it's like Al Capone was made uh, a historical figure because of Hollywood. Al Capone wasn't in the mob world what people uh, think he was. I mean, he was uh, he was a shooter. They brought him out from New York to, to because of the prohibition wars in Chicago, and he would shoot people. So uh, he was brought out to to do just that, and he got a lot of notoriety, and the press ate it up, and Hollywood ate it up. And uh, uh, what they don't tell the true story is that uh, when instead of killing him and making a martyr out of him, when they put the commission together back in uh, uh, in the, the 30s, they they brought him. Charlie Charlie Luciano uh, brought him back to Philadelphia. They had a meeting in Atlantic City, and uh, Charlie said to him, uh, "Tomorrow you're going to go to a movie theater in Philadelphia with a gun in your pocket, and they're going to lock you up." Mm -hmm. And he spent a year in jail in Pennsylvania. No one ever talks about that. And when he came out of Pennsylvania and went back to Chicago, they were waiting for him for tax evasion. And that's how they got him off the streets. And he was dying of syphilis, so he didn't spend that much time in jail because he was dying. So they sent him to Florida, and he, they, they threw him out of jail, and he went to Florida and retired very unheralded. You know, he was uh, he was just uh, – uh, he, he took care of business by, you know, shooting opposite gangs and stuff like that and made a big name for himself in, in, in Chicago. But instead of making a hero out of him by a martyr by shooting him, they just they, they put him away and, you know, and, and he died of in, in obscurity, mm -hmm. so to speak. You know? And he was never really the boss of Chicago anyway. Tony Accardo was. And the guy who really was behind it all was a guy named, um, they called him the waiter, Paul Ricci. And he was, uh, what a neat guy he was, actually. I kind of liked him right before he died. I met him. Um, but they, you know, Chicago was was a different uh, city. So were most of the cities. So there was, you know, one of the things, like I tell people when I wrote the book and I come out and people had, you know, conferences with people and stuff. And, uh, and, and, and I said to people, you know, where were you born? And they said, well, I was born in New York or I was born here in this city or that city. I said, you know, in the era when when the, the families controlled things in, in in their in their streets, there were no drive-by shootings. People never locked their front doors. You understand that? Mm. The safety Different in now. neighborhoods was amazing. I, when I was a kid, lived in Philadelphia, we never locked our front door. We, you know, kids could go out in the street and play from sun up to sundown, and no one ever bothered them. You could leave a baby pram outside of your house. No one ever touched it. You understand? The, the, the violence in the neighborhoods was, was quite controlled. 
you had certain areas that you had the mixed uh, uh, ethnic groups that were fighting each other and stuff like that and uh, foolishness. But you didn't have, uh, like I said, there was no drive-by shootings. There was, there was no, none of that garbage was in the streets in those days. Yeah. You know, crime area. was a much different, whole different. They had a control. These guys had a power that was amazing because they were involved. They were all involved with each other. And, they, and so what we're doing with Family Legacy is we're going to show how they took their illicit monies and put it back into the growth of a country. They underwrote companies like Sears and Roebuck, Westinghouse, General Electric. They controlled the insurance companies. They, they put a lot of money in the insurance companies. And Meyer Lansky was a very clever man. And they invested uh, the elements of what they made in a lot of places that it gave. They, they created jobs for a lot of people. They owned the unions. They created a lot of construction jobs. They, you know, they, uh, their, their main focus when they, when they started was, uh, was gambling and extortion, you know. So how are they going to get money out of you if you're not working or if your company's not making money? And how soon so they you- made sure that people made money. And you said you're looking to make this into a series. What's the timetable? We're, gonna do, time we're developing a series that. now. We're, we're developing a series. So I would think probably about a year. Okay. Uh, and we're also looking to do because we have so much material. We're going to do films and we're going to do a series. And there's there's a lot of things that questions that the book. When I wrote the book, the book goes from my father's death to Kennedy's death, and I tell a lot of truth. And I tell the truth about the Kennedy assassination, you know, uh, which is coming out every year, every every so many years, more information comes out about the Kennedy's assassination, you know, which was one of the pivotal things in our society, in, in our era, um, how he died, why he died. Um, and people don't realize that John Kennedy... Uh, I like John. I met Jack Kennedy when he was uh, when he was a senator in Boston, and he was a great politician and a nice guy. I, I kind of liked him a lot. His father was not the nicest person in the world, and his father was a controlling guy. And his father, people don't realize, his father was under thumb to organized crime since the 20s. And, in fact, the only building that he ever really put money into was a mercantile building in downtown Chicago because they made him do it. And he, you know, he was under control to Chicago for a long time. And he, when he was wanted to run Jack for president and stuff and got involved, they all of a sudden television came into a play. And the Kiefer commissions and Bobby was on that committee and they were aiming at, he was trying to get out from under thumb. He double crossed everybody he ever did anything with, and which was very sad, you know. And he was just that type of person. And he... Um, uh, in fact, if it wasn't for Chicago, Jack Kennedy would never become president. Mm-hmm. He would never get nominated. I mean, they, when they were out here in Los Angeles in the nominations, um, Joe Kennedy was supposed to have had all the electoral votes sewed up. And after two days, he called Sam Giancana and he said, uh, we have a problem. And Sam said, well, I thought you said you had it. He said, no, 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 we, we need, we need uh, this state and that state. So... Sam did a few things in Chicago, Illinois, uh, which was never Democrat, turned Democrat. Boom. You know, and a couple states around it that gave the electoral votes to Kennedy. And then uh, after the third day, he called again. He said, we, we still have a problem. But there was one state that had enough electoral votes to push him across the line uh, to get him nominated. And uh, that was the state of West Virginia. For, you know, for a little state, they had a lot of electoral votes because of the industry down there, uh, you know, the the coal industry and stuff. And there was a lot of money down there. So we had a lot of casinos in that, you know, illegal casinos in in West Virginia because there was a lot of money and people gambled. And, uh, so some phone calls were made some debt was excused. And West Virginia raised her hand and Jack Kenney was nominated for presidency. And, uh, you know, and, and when he was when he was running, when he was out there for the nomination, some people from Dallas, which there were 10 people down in Dallas, were probably four of them were the wealthiest people in the world. H.L. Hunt, 
went to California and gave a suitcase full of money to uh, to Joe Kennedy for Johnson to run on a ticket with uh, Kennedy. And nobody ever talked about that either. You know, and uh, they uh, when he became president, uh, his father whispered in his ear, he said, you see those oil guys down there in Texas? He said, uh, they're making a fortune on surplus oil and taxation wise they're avoiding tax and all this stuff you got an issue with tax against this well that cost those people a couple hundred million dollars they weren't very happy about it you know so because he double crossed everybody you know everything he did he bobby kennedy was supposed to be made ambassador to ireland he made him attorney general and here's something that's going to come out it's been talked about a few times and uh, the whole one bullet theory of Oswald is all garbage because Jack Kennedy was shot three times. Mm -hmm. He was shot in the throat. He was shot in his lower back and he was shot right in front of his head. The guy driving the car turned and took the shot that make him when you see him fly back and the back of his head come out. Of, that's because he got shot from the front. They, uh, the first guy that got shot was Conley. He fell down, and Jack fell on top of him when he got shot in the throat. You see him grab his throat and fall forward. And uh, he, the, the back shot, no one knows when that happened, And because there were 13 shots fired that day in Dealey Plaza. And the driver, Greer, you know, instead of speeding the car up, he slowed down to like 11 miles an hour, and Kennedy was right between the seats there, and he just turned like that, and bang, shot him. Mm. And that footage has been available. That was the eight missing frames out of the Bruder film that people can see right now. And they've had seen them, you know, so and it shows distinctly who shot the last shot that that pushed him back. And, and you know, so but you had to ask yourself a question. Who was the number one cop in the country when Jack Kennedy died? And everybody said, well, Hoover. No, Hoover wasn't. Jack Bobby was because he was the attorney general. In charge of Bobby was his second. Bobby was his brother's second skin everywhere he went in his career. And he didn't go to Dallas before. He didn't go during. And he never went afterwards because he knew his brother wasn't coming home. And his father would rather seen him die the way he died down there than die from a disease and mark the family, hmm. which is you'd say that's kind of cold, right? Why would a guy think that? But then stop and think what he did to his daughter. He lobotomized his daughter because she suffered from ODD. You know, she was, and they had no answer for it in those days. And he was afraid she was going to make a big scene at some affair somewhere and make the family look like they had a crazy person in it. Hmm. And they, so he lobotomized her. She sat in an institution for like 70 years before she died. Yeah. You know, so that's pretty cold. Yeah. You know what I mean? And he was that type of an individual, you know, and uh, to see, rather see, he knew Jack had had Addison's disease and and he had syphilis and a couple other diseases. He was, they shot him up every day to keep him in existence, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So when he died, you know, uh, and it was a landmark in the country and, and people, you know, everybody wondered who they were going to blame. They, you know, they, they had the Kiefer Commission come out. You had, you had the the Warren Commission come out and writing all these commission things up and everything about who did what and what where. And four people went to see Bobby before Jack went to Texas, one of them being Adlai Stevenson, and said, do not let your brother go to Texas. The animosity down there is horrendous. Not a good idea. Mm -hmm. And then he's down there in an open car, you know, and it took them four months to reroute that thing down Dealey Plaza. And you had the bird building there and all these people walking around with open windows with the president of the United States right below you in an open car. Never should happen ever. Yeah. So, you know, there were like 32 people at, at the Dealey Plaza that day could, that could have been assassins. Yeah. yeah. And, Jack, you know, it's a, it's a sad deal. Jack, you've met uh, an extraordinary amount of people uh, in this business, uh, obviously in different areas, uh, po political, boxing, uh, and in the acting field. You already mentioned James Earl Jones, uh, Rich, uh, Robert Mitchum. Uh, you had a chance to work with some pretty big names on uh, the Superman films, Gene Hackman, Marlon Brando, oh, Chris Reeve, Jackie Cooper. Uh, could you Hackman talk about and that I experience? Did, Hackman, Hackman and I did, uh, uh, we were doing a picture called March or Die. 
down in Spain, and uh, we he he fell off a horse and got hurt, and then they um, they uh, we had some time off, so they asked us to come to London to meet Richard Donner, mm-hmm. uh, who was doing a Superman picture, and um, I had just turned down the the Bond picture. They wanted me to do. Jaws in yeah. the Bond pictures, and I turned it down. Went to Richard Keel. Because I was, <laughs> yeah, because I was doing March or Die, and you know, and they said, well, we can work it out. This and that, and I said, eh, I didn't like the script. So Mitchum said to me, well, if you don't like the script, don't do the movie. So I said, okay, so I turned it down. So they came out and asked me to to London. I met Donner to do Superman, mm-hmm. and when I had read the script, and I said, uh, yeah, and he said. Well, we want you to play this guy. He's a deaf, dumb, mute. And he said, uh, do you have a problem with that? And I said, no, because uh, Jackie Gleason was a friend of mine. And he did a picture called Gigo Mm -hmm. that he won an Oscar for. And I said, if I ever got an opportunity to do a film where I could use facial expressions and body language, I'm going to jump at it and do it. And, And that was an opportunity to do that. And when the Superman, when you stop and think about it, you had three villains. Terrence was this vicious general. Mm -hmm. Sarah was a man-eater. And somebody had to relate to the kids. So Mm -hmm. I said, you know, I'm going to take this vicious guy and and I'm going to do it with childlike mannerisms. And like a child learning how to walk and talk and use their eyes and stuff like that. And, uh, and, And I did that and it worked out very well, you know. What was a it? lot of, yeah. Uh, I was going to ask you, what was it like? Because, I mean, that was a classic in the 70s and in the 80s. And then, Still. Yeah, and then in 2006, uh, there was a clamoring online for the Richard Donner version of Superman 2 to come out. What, yep. was, what was it like 30 years later to have a brand new film release and get so much accolades and so much acclaim? Well, you know, the uh, the Donner cut I like better than the Lester cut mm-hmm. because it, it was, I mean, Dick was a brilliant director. And and he lived, eat, and slept Superman. And what they did, the Salkinds, they 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 they're just they were very greedy people, and they um, they owed Richard Lester a picture, and Donner was costing them money. I mean, it's the same as when they did the Superman two movie; mm-hmm. they cut Brando out. Yeah. All of his footage was already shot, but they didn't want to pay him the points. So they cut him out, and they put the and they put the mother in mm-hmm. in his place. Well, all that footage was there. We had shot all that footage because the first eleven days was Brando to get the money. Once they had Brando on camera, they went to Italy and they got the money to do the film, and they did two films together. You mm-hmm. know, one and two, which we shot at the same time, and uh, and Brando. God, I love Marlon. Marlon was Marlon was a was a trip. We 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 became very good friends on the film. Uh, but it was a great cast. Superman had a uh, a great cast to it. And, and Christopher Reeve, you'll never get another Superman that played both characters as well as Reeve did. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was his first movie, per se, you know. And he did, and, and he was a little skinny, 170 pound guy when he first came on the set. And when they went to build him up, and I talked to the bodybuilder, who's uh, who's a good guy, who played Darth Vader, and I told him, I said, don't pump him and, and put a lot of bulk on him. Do like a Steve Reeves and do definition with him, because Chris didn't want to wear anything underneath the costume that was going to show muscle riveted or anything of that nature. He was, you know, he want, wanted to be as natural as possible. Mm-hmm. So they built him like, uh, like Chris, like Steve Reeves, the, with his all definition. And they put 20 pounds on him rather than put 30 pounds on him. And, and it worked out really well, you know, and he, uh, he, but he just, he had, he had a great knack for the character. And it's very sad that he didn't, we, they were supposed to do 10 because they were running, with the Indiana Jones pictures, you know, uh, they, it was like this one that come out. So they they were supposed to do a whole slew of them. And the problem, when the problem arose, and you saw Lester on the set, I said something's wrong here. And uh, they got rid of Donner, and they used all kinds of excuses that he was spending too much money and all this other jazz. But the movies were making a fortune, and, and so you 
uh, the, to let him finish two, he would have done three, four, and five. And he and Mankiewicz were just so into Superman, and it would have been a much different franchise. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and to let Lester come in, and, and Lester, it was like night and day, like a TV commercial guy and, and, and a movie you know, director. Um, and Christopher should have stood up and said, no Donner, no me. Mm -hmm. And Hackman never came back. Hackman said, uh, you know, Donner, I'm not coming back. And they had enough footage because they shot the footage to cover Hackman. And then they used a stunt guy to uh, and, and whose back was to you in certain scenes, and which I could point out to you. But, you know, it was uh, it was sad. It was really, really sad, you know, because Donner lived, eat and slept Superman. And uh, so the Donner cut is very good, except he never had a chance to shoot the ending the way he wanted it, mm -hmm. you know. But it's still uh, applauded by a lot of people to be a much better film because it was more serious. Didn't have as much comedy in it as, as the one we did with Lester. But the Lester picture was good because the 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 whole Superman, you got to understand, Superman was the very first American superhero. And to do, to, 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 to like what they're doing today, the pictures are so dark. Mm hmm you know, and, and Superman's watching people die, and he would have never done that in, in, in our versions. You know, it was a whole different, uh, the all-American way was there. It was, you know, it was a whole different thing for a, of an American way of life. You know what I mean? Yeah. And a lot and, of people uh, feel that way, too. And I'm, I'm surprised because so many people refer to the movies you made in those Superman movies, uh, the hope and the optimism, and yet the, the producers of the, the superhero films nowadays, they never seem to well, get that. They just keep getting darker no, and darker. Darker and darker. And, you know, and it's sad because we broke a lot of precedents. The reason why the movie stands up so much is in, through the years because when we did it, we broke precedents uh, technology-wise. Mm -hmm. The flying shots, to see us going under buildings and ar uh, around and under bridges and around buildings and everything. We did a, a thing called Zorn's Optic Vision, and uh, they shot us into the film. So there were no wires or anything, and, and you could do a lot of the fight scenes and everything were, were so, looked so authentic, you know. They were time taking to do it, but they came out brilliantly. I mean, they they, they shot Vista Vision on Vista Vision. We were they had this big 70 foot screen, and poles came through it, and with body molds, and we laid in the body molds, and they shot us as they were showing the film. They shot us into it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. We had different motions and movements that we could do on these on these body molds with these poles of the flying shots and turns, and and, all, and it was. Uh, it just worked out brilliantly. It really, uh, they broke a lot of technology rules, and it, it wasn't CGI. It was it was a Zorm's optic vision they did, and it worked exceedingly well. It really did. I'm very proud of those movies. I thought we did a great job. Yeah, and they still stay on the test of time. And I guess you're still close oh, yeah. with a lot of your cast members from those that film and some of the others too. Sarah's uh, Sarah and I are very close. Terrence, so uh, yeah, Sarah. In fact, she's here in L.A. We just saw it. We just had dinner. Um, and Sarah's a superwoman. Jai, what a great lady. I mean, the whole cast on Superman was brilliant. Mark McClure and I are very close, and he's uh, he lives in Palm Springs. And, um, and I see, you know, uh, Terrence. I haven't seen, but we're we're good friends. You know, uh, we stay. I mean, when you work with people for four years. It becomes like a family, mm -hmm. you know. Valerie Perrine is a super lady. She's in physical bad health today, but she's a, she was a, she was a she's just a wonderful person. Uh, the Hackman was was is is an amazing guy. I love Gene. You know, we did two like we did the March or Die, and then we did the two Superman pictures. Um, and, and the whole the whole cast on on the film was, I mean, they they couldn't have cast the movie better. Mm -hmm. You know. Terrence was Terrence was a brilliant actor, and he was just coming back into his career. He had went away and cleaned his body up and all that stuff, and uh, he was one of the one of the heartthrobs of the industry when he was a young kid. And, and, and uh, you know, um, then he got into sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And his brother was a manager of the Who, and uh, but then Terrence went to India and he cleaned his whole act up. He got raw and this meditation. And Superman was the first movie he did on his comeback. Mm -hmm. 
man, he, what a brilliant actor. Geez, Terrence is just such a brilliant, and one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. He's just a good guy. All right, what's uh, what's uh, next for you? I know you've been in some films lately. You talked about your production company, and uh, what, what do you have coming up down the pike? Well, we're developing um, we're developing family legacy, mm -hmm. and uh, that's working out pretty well. I have a film I'm going to do in Ireland that I wrote years ago called Ballad of a Simple Man, which is uh, there was a picture called The Informer that John Ford uh, won an Oscar for, and Victor McLaughlin won the leading Oscar for, won four Oscars back in the 30s. And I wrote another adaption of the book, Liam O'Flaherty's book, which uh, was a pretty good script, and had it up to that four or five times to do it. I just didn't like the deal, so I kept sticking it on the shelf. And we're getting ready to go to Ireland to set that up and, and, and do it. And it's a role that I wanted to do for a long time. And, and I think uh, I might sneak under the wire and get it done <laughs> um, before I kick out of here. <laughs> you know, but it's, uh, uh, you know, that's a, that's that's a picture I want to do. And uh, we've got uh, we've put together a production company to uh, to to do some. We have several films that we'd like to get done. Uh, we're putting on a scout, so uh, things are moving forward pretty good. You know, we uh, <clears throat> we were working closely with a man who just bought Desi Lou Studios, and uh, he's a good guy, uh, Charles Henley. And uh, we've got a couple different outlets that we're going to do, and we we put an accounting situation together that's going to revolutionize the business a little bit and put the money on the screen where it belongs. Uh, and you just you try to do things that you know, leaves a mark in your life, you know, mm -hmm. that uh, you leave something when you go away from something. And, and I, I enjoy the film business. I think it's a great industry. You know, it's, uh, uh, there's no better way to, and, and to do family legacy, um, there's no better way to tell a story than do it on film, mm -hmm. you know. And I think that it's time that a lot of truth be told about how our country grew and where it's at and what's going on. And, uh, and I think that uh, I think this will help people to say that they have the right to make a decision today, mm -hmm. you know, on their own. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, Jack, thanks so much for your time, all the great stories, and uh, for everything you've done in, in both boxing, uh, the NFL, and uh, also on pictures. Thank you. It's been a great time. Take care, guys. All right.